en el círculo son excepcionales, pero este es muy excepcional. Y quisiera empezar dando las gracias en nombre del círculo al consulado de Estados Unidos, que ha facilitado la, la llegada de Seth Benzel aquí, para empezar. Bueno, yo solo voy a decir cuatro cosas. La primera es que, como todo el mundo sabe, vamos a tratar de, de un asunto que tiene una amplitud y una velocidad seguramente desconocidas hasta entonces. Si hablamos de, de la amplitud, eh, démonos cuenta solo de una cifra que, que Seth repetirá después. El 85% de las tareas, no de los puestos de trabajo, de las tareas, son susceptibles de ser transformadas por la revolución digital. Lo segundo que tenemos que tener presente es que, que son susceptibles de ser, no quiere decir ni que lo vayan a ser, ni que lo tengan que ser. ¿Eh? Es, entre, entre que lo puedan ser y, lo, y, lo, y vayan a serlo, de, es, de esto depende de, de, de muchos factores. <coughs> Creo que nos preocupamos mucho sobre el efecto de toda esta revolución digital sobre los puestos de trabajo, sobre el empleo. Yo creo que nos tenemos que, pre que preocupar también, quizá mucho más, del efecto sobre los salarios. No sobre el empleo, sino sobre los salarios. Particularmente en un momento en que las economías avanzadas están sufriendo un problema de distribución de la renta, del cual la gente se está quejando cada vez más. Eh, los políticos tienen un papel mm, mm, muy importante a, a desempeñar. ¿Por qué? Porque esto no... No se puede confiar solo a las fuerzas del mercado. En primer lugar, porque el mercado no es un mercado competitivo. Y, en, en segundo lugar, porque incluso un mercado competitivo puede crear grandes números de perdedores. Entonces, los políticos tienen que trabajar con un letrero que dice los grandes cambios generan perdedores. Y un letrero más pequeño que dice los perdedores se resisten. Entonces, los, los políticos tienen que ver si un cambio tecnológico va a, a, a generar grandes cantidades de perdedores o perdedores, muy perdedores o no. Y si, si este es el caso, pues a lo mejor el cambio tecnológico se tiene que poder dirigir. En cualquier caso hay que tener presente que el cambio tecnológico no es una fuerza ciega, no tiene por qué serlo. ¿eh? Nosotros tenemos una cierta responsabilidad en orientarlo para que sirva al bienestar de la gente, que es para lo que tiene que servir. Finalmente, de todo esto hablará con, con propiedad Seth, porque Seth sabe de todo esto, pero además eh, tiene una, 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 una cosa eh, curiosa. En general, en este asunto de, la, de la, la digitalización, los que explicamos no sabemos nada y los que saben no explican nada. Bueno, Seth se explica y además sabe, porque está en primera línea, está trabajando con uno de los grupos seguramente más directamente, más directamente eh, implicados en este asunto de la revolución digital. Finalmente, lo, único que, lo, único que, que, lo último que quiero decir es que esta revolución nos, nos planteará problemas. Siempre estas cosas plantean problemas y nos obligará a elegir, obligará a elegir a todo el mundo. Hay que recordar en este sentido una frase de unos, un, un liberal absolutamente uh, uh, empecinado, que era Lord Robbins, que dijo no hay nada en la economía que exima a la gente de la obligación de elegir. Y con esto le doy la, la palabra a Seth Benzel. Bueno, tienen su presentación aquí. Él se graduó en, en matemáticas y en física en Tulane, en, en, en Nueva Orleans. Hizo el máster en economía y, y en política allí. Y finalmente se graduó en, 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 en uh, economía en, uh, en Boston University. El que haya ido no de MIT a Boston University, sino de Boston University a MIT, quiere decir que es muy bueno. Muy bueno. ¿eh? Bueno, con esto yo creo que ya les puedo dejar comer. Adelante. Uh, so I'd like to thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you so, all so much for the opportunity to talk to all of you. I know many of you are business leaders yourselves. So um, I'm very interested to hear any kind of practical details me and my academic friends may have missed and to hear back from you if anything I'm saying sounds incorrect. Uh, <coughs> but uh, thank you again so much for your hospitality. Okay, so it's a rather unwieldy title that I've ended up with, but I've tried to hit most of these points. Um, so as we know, technological advances allow an economy to do more with the same amount of inputs, but we think that these can bring new challenges. 
So I'm going to start by talking about how new technologies have changed the economy over the last 30 or so years. Then I'll talk a little bit about how some emerging technologies might continue to change the economy in the near future. And then finally, I'll spend some time talking about different proposed approaches to these challenges for workers, firms, investors, and governments, and talk through some of the pros and cons of these different approaches. So I want to focus on three big trends over the last 30 years that I think can be attributed to technological changes. The decrease in labor's share of income, skill polarization, and superstar economics for firms and workers. So uh, we all know GDP is a way of measuring all of the output in the economy. And so one way of slicing up GDP is to say what percentage of that money is being paid to workers versus people who own businesses and firms and machines and rent them out or make profits. And as many of you know, uh, in the, uh, it has been declining significantly over the last 30 or so years. Previously in the United States, it had been pretty constant until the, until the 1980s, uh, but in the US and other developed countries, it's decreased. In Spain, it's decreased from approximately 68% in 1980 to about 60% today. Um, and there's research on all of these connecting the macro trend to new technologies that I'm happy to talk about if you have questions. A second trend I'd like to talk about, again, in all developing country, developed countries, is skill polarization. By that I mean wages and employment going up for people at the very high end of the wage scale and people at the low end of the wage scale, but low employment growth and low wage growth or even shrinking uh, wage growth and shrinking employment for people in the middle uh, of w the wage distribution. So uh, in Spain, we've seen since 1993 through 2010, a 12% decrease in the share of the population that's working these middle skill jobs, 2% <coughs> increase in the low end, and a 10% increase in the high end. Finally, there's been increasing returns to being the absolute very best as a worker or as a company. So I'm sure many of you have heard about increasing inequality. And sometimes people think about increasing inequality as being driven by profits and returns to business, but increasing inequality is happening within wages as well. So these are figures that show that the share of labor income earned by various percentiles of American workers. And as you can see, uh, the top 25% of workers are getting an increasing share of income, and within the top 10%, an increasing share is going to the top 2.5%. But what's fascinating is if we zoom in even further, we can see that even within the 1%, an increasing share is going to the top quarter within the top 1%, and all the way down to the top 0.001% until we're talking about you know, handfuls of people, right? So not only are the rich pulling away from the moderate income, the super rich are pulling away from the rich, and the super duper rich are pulling away from the super rich. Um, possibly this is driven in large part by new information technologies. So the old story which is often told is think about the old days if you wanted to hear some music in your house, right? You'd have to go out and hire a band to play some music. But nowadays, you don't go out and hire a band. You turn, you go, turn on your laptop, you put on Groove Shark, or you put on YouTube, and you play your favorite artist, right? So instead, what used to be a source of spending for a large swath of medium-skilled people, musicians, is now a source of income for one or two very w productive uh, companies, YouTube, Groove Shark, or Spotify, and a handful of very, very productive and liked musicians. So who gets those, who gets that money? People who aren't maybe dramatically better musicians than the musician you could hire around the corner, but if they're just a little bit better, you'd prefer to listen to them rather than somebody else. So in other words, these technologies allow slightly better workers to get a bigger slice of the pie. Um, similarly, we're seeing a same thing with firms. 
in companies, we're seeing greater concentration in industries with all with um, more of the comp more of these industries being dominated by the most productive and therefore most profitable companies. So, uh, in a paper on this subject, we see that uh, at industry concentration rising, and then in those industries, average profits rising, but in a very skewed way with the most productive firms making the profits and lots of smaller firms making very marginal profits. And because these companies are making so much profits, uh, they just don't have, th the ratio of profit income to labor income is very off. And so that tends to rate lower the labor share of income as well. And so one of the types of companies that's driving that phenomenon are platform companies. Platform companies are interesting in that they can have lots and lots of value, but still have, but not have any employees or capital at all. So for example, um, a company like Marriott, which owns wonderful properties all around the world, has 200,000 employees, was founded back in 1927, is worth only a little bit more than a company like Airbnb, founded in 2008, with only 5,000 employees um, and doesn't own a single hotel. So these platforms are businesses that are similarly <coughs> winner take all. If you can make a platform that's a little bit better than the other guy's platform, you're likely to grab a huge share of the market and a huge share of the profits uh, because there's very little marginal cost. And my Okay, here we go, all right. So a little bit of lag. Let me go back, okay. So, um, so I've told you a little bit about technologies in the past. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about technologies moving forward. Let's see if we can get this little video to play. May or may not play. Okay. There are a lot of um, robe, uh, maybe, play it, would you? Thank you. Okay, uh, go back. You should, maybe if you right click the, uh, right click, maybe. It's not super important. In any case, in the short term, don't think about these humanoid robots. Think in terms of machine learning technologies. Okay, so what do I mean by machine learning technologies? So let me first give you a little bit of vocabulary. Artificial intelligence is a series of techniques for computers to simulate human intelligence. Back in the 70s or so, there were a lot of efforts to kind of simulate human intelligence with things called expert systems. And expert systems follow a series of explicit rules in order to achieve some sort of goal. So for example, you know, you could categorize things into categories by following a taxonomic tree or you could brute force solve solutions to proofs by starting with five or, so al um, five or so axioms. Here's the proof you want to get to and just trying every single combination of those axioms until you have generated the proof. But eventually this approach to making intelligent machines hit a brick wall. The reason for that is something called Polanyi's paradox. Polanyi's paradox is a uh, phenomenon uh, documented by an economist, which is the idea that we know more than we can tell. So for example, I know intuitively how to recognize a chair, right? You know, it looks like a chair, it's a chair. But if you ask me, Seth, write down a set of, se a series of formal rules so that a computer can identify via a series of pixels what is a chair, I wouldn't even know where to start. <coughs> <coughs> Similarly, the world's top players of games like Go often are unable to explain why they think a move is the best move. There are certain rules of thumb, like in chess, don't double up your pawns, but when you should break those rules and when those rules apply are not the sorts of things that can be written down formally in a list. 
So what you need to do is to get the computer to learn on its own what the rules are. You can't just explain what the rules are, and that's machine learning. Machine learning is a series of techniques for getting the computer to learn on its own what the, what the correct way to solve the problem is or to do the sorting problem. Deep learning in particular is a, a very exciting um, way that has been shown to have great success in machine learning recently. Um, within machine learning, there's a couple of different approaches. Reinforcement learning is uh, learning where you give the computer some sort of utility function to maximize. So make moves and go such that you win games and over time the computer learns these sorts of moves tend to lead to victories and these sorts of moves tend to lead to losses. And supervised learning is when you take uh, some pre-sorted data and you say, hey computer, here's a couple of examples of dogs, here's a couple of examples of cats, try to figure out what distinguishes the dog pictures from the cat pictures. Unsupervised learning is still in its infancy, but would be a more general way for the computer to generate its own concepts. Um, now again, we're not talking about artificial general intelligence, you know, supercomputers uh, from science fiction novels, we're talking about just simulating some kinds of intelligence. And what's really interesting about these machine learning techniques is that recently, more and more tools have come online to democratize access to these technologies. So organizations like Fast AI, which does online courses on the most cutting edge uh, deep learning techniques are available. Uh, Kaggle, which is a crowdsourcing platform. So if you're a company that has some sort of prediction problem, like uh, as an example, you're a company that needs to predict um, who will default on their loans, you could put out data about, you know, here's some histories of different customers we've had. These are the ones that have defaulted on their loans. And now you put it out to the internet, you crowdsource the solution, and these people are going to use machine learning techniques themselves. And then finally, you were even starting to automate the use of some of these machine learning tools. So that's a project under development. AutoML is one of the approaches to that. So just to show you just how easy it is to use these machine learning tools, I am not a computer scientist. I took one of these Fast AI online courses and I built an image classifier that classifies images into either pictures of La Tomatina or of San Fermines. So I started with 800 images from Google. I trained the algorithm on two thirds of the data and I kept one third of the data outside as a validation data set. So I didn't let the computer see those. Of the t what I was stunned to find is that of the 248 total test images, only three were misclassified. The computer was astoundingly good at sorting images into San Fermines versus Tomatina. So the top three images there are the top three most San fermines images on Google Images. This is thank you to my RA for downloading 800 pictures from Google Images. And the bottom three are the most tomatina e images. Um, so I told you only three were misclassified. These <coughs> are the three images that were misclassified. <coughs> the first two are images of San Fermines that were incorrectly classified as tomatina. What I think is, is that big red balloon looks like a tomato. <laughs> And then that very last image is an image of Tomatina that was classified as San Fermin as I think it's picking up the red sash around the woman's neck. Okay, and so it's no surprise to note, so this is, all, this is using neural networks and deep learning techniques. And using these techniques, researchers have been able to beat human level performance on the task of identifying images from a standardized image database. You know, is this a dog, is this a cat, is this a horse? And so now the question is, if computers are really good at this task, how many jobs are like this task? Um, so some of my co-authors, Eric Brynjolfsson, Daniel Rock, along with uh, Mitchell, went ahead and evaluated 964 occupations to see how suitable they were for machine learning. There's good news and bad news. The good news is that almost no occupation is completely suitable for machine learning, right? And remember, we're not talking about all emerging technologies, we're just talking about uh, machine learning, which is evaluated as, is this a task that maps a standard input 
to a standard output with a clear success criteria. Uh, so most tasks involve some touching of a person or some non-standard setting, at least some of the time, most jobs that is. However, almost every job has at least some component that does have some components. Every job has some tasks that does, is suitable for machine learning. And so, uh, so just to give two examples, credit authorizers versus massage therapists, a credit authorizer, someone who looks at data about a person and decides, should I give this person a loan, is very much a suitable task for machine learning. Whereas massage therapy, which involves talking to a client, putting your hands on them, manipulating a non-standard object, um, are not super suitable for machine learning. Okay. Um, the second thing I'd like to point out, which is interesting about this new rate round of technological change, is that it doesn't seem to be correlated with the wage of the occupation. So what I showed you previously is that there was skill polarization as a result of the previous round of technological change, right? And the reason for that, as uh, posited by scholars like Ator and Dorn, is that what technologies of the last 30 years were good at was at automating routine work, right? Work where you know, you're typesetting in an office or where you're doing a very standardized, repetitive thing in a factory. Those tended to be middle income jobs and those tended to be the kinds of jobs that could be automated by the previous round of technologies. This new round of technologies doesn't seem to be correlated with the occupation. So you can see in this scatter plot, a scatter plot of the wage of the occupation against how suitable the occupation is for machine learning. And perhaps this isn't so surprising. We can think easily of some really high end jobs that are really functionally just trying to make a decision about an image. The one I think about is in uh, medical imaging, right? So in uh, the field of radiology, what you do is you look at an x-ray and you try to find where the bones are broken or you look at a biopsy and you try to figure out is this a cancer cell versus <coughs> not a cancer cell. This is effectively the same problem as the San Fermines versus Tomatina problem, right? And so there are plenty of examples of higher skilled jobs that are suitable for machine learning, at least in part. Okay, there are other predictions out there of how many jobs are vulnerable to technology. Uh, Frey and Osborne have one, McKinsey has one. In the McKinsey study, they say that 48% of Spanish work hours are spent on tasks that are technically automatable by adopting current technology. And what they mean by that is, you, uh, if you had seen the video, you'd see the Atlas robot trying to pick up a box. And so we have robots that can kind of pick up boxes and move them across the room. Right now, they're not economically feasible, right? So just because a job is technically feasible doesn't mean it's going to get automated anytime soon. But the second thing I want to point out about this slide is that we're talking about work hours. We're not talking about jobs. Like I talked about in the previous slide, many jobs have some component which is suitable for automation and some component which is not suitable for automation. And one of the big challenges for businesses in the years ahead will be to what extent can you recreate jobs, slice off the part that can be automated from the part that only humans can do. And sometimes this is gonna be way harder than it sounds. One example there that I think about is in automated delivery, right? So we all know that in the near future, automated uh, cars are going to start hitting the market, right? And so imagine you're Amazon and you want to hire these automated cars to deliver your packages so you don't have to hire delivery people anymore. Well, it may be the case that you can automate the 95% of the work, which is driving the truck around, but you can't automate that last 5% which is picking up the box from the back of the truck, going to the apartment building, pushing the button, going up to the fifth floor and leaving the box at the person's apartment. And so the question will be, can you reorganize the job so that the 95% of the work can be done with the computer without the person sitting around in the truck? Or are you gonna have to have a person sitting around in the truck the whole time? In which case you can't really automate the job at all. Um, and so, that's kind of the question moving forward. There are people who think that these new technologies will put a lot of jobs at risk, 
and there are some who are less concerned. So I gave you one reason you might want to be less concerned, which is that it might be hard to reorganize the jobs to slice off the automatable part. One reason you might be more concerned is uh, an anecdote involving the Cambrian explosion. Okay, so if you think back to your evolutionary history, there's a period of time where the, there are some multi-celled organisms moving around in the primordial ocean, and then all of a sudden, there was a big explosion in a diversity of creatures, crustaceans, fish, things like that, that had a huge diversity of life called the Cambrian explosion. There's a couple of different theories about what was the bottleneck was overcome to generate that moment. And one of the leading theories is that that's when the eye was perfected. So the first creatures developed eyes. This enabled lots of different kinds of life to emerge. And therefore, that enabled the Cambrian explosion. So, you know, I just showed you that machines are starting to do something a lot that looks a lot like vision. So maybe that will enable a huge new diversity of robots and machines to become available. Um, of course, these machines are not truly intelligent. They cannot reason outside of context. They're not true artificial general intelligences. Uh, they can't do empathetic tasks, and that's going to turn out to be something that's important. Um, and one sort of open question is to what extent artificial intelligences can be creative. So there are some stories out there of AIs developing musical scores. Here's one example of an AI doing something like creativity. Using deepdreamgenerator.com, you can use a neural network, of a si so a similar technology to the one that I used to make the classifier, and you can tell the computer, hey, take what something that looks like in this image of San Fermines. If it kind of looks like a dog, make it look more like a dog. If it kind of looks like a bird, make it look more like a bird and kind of enhance that several rounds. And so you can see, I don't know if you want to call that creativity, but it's certainly, certainly trippy looking. Okay. Um, so with all of these old and new technologies, the question becomes, why are there still so many jobs, right? So we all know about the Luddites who were at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, who were worried that the textile mills were taking their jobs, and they smashed the mills. Um, and perhaps they were middle-skilled workers themselves who were being replaced by capital and lower-skilled labor in the form of, you know, children. Um, but we still have jobs. So why do economists think that technologies tend to, new technologies tend to raise wages in the long run, even if they depress them for some people or all people in the short run? Well, the answer is that in the short run, technologies boost productivity. They may lower short-run labor demand and wage, but what they also do is they should increase interest rates, right? So imagine you're a company, and all of a sudden a new technology comes out that's really exciting that you can use to replace one of your workers, right? Well, you're going to be really excited. You want to make a big investment in that new technology, right? You want to go take out a loan from a bank or raise capital in the financial markets and then buy some more of that new technology, right? What that should do is increase interest rates, right? In economics, we sometimes say that the marginal product of capital should have something to do with the interest rate. And what these new technologies do, if they're <coughs> substituting capital for labor, should be mar raising the marginal product of capital. And so what should happen in the long run is after businesses <coughs> take all this new money from their productivity and see their high interest rates, they're going to make investments the new technologies and the new capital will accumulate. Eventually, you'll have an overabundance of them. The interest rate will come down, and then wages will be forced up. Humans will become workers, and humans will become relatively scarce again, and they'll have higher wages than they did in the beginning. If you look at economic models of automation and endogenous growth, this tends to be the main phenomenon, so long as there's at least one job that only humans can do. Um, that being said, there are still some big open questions in technology. All three of these are things that I'm looking into myself in my research, and other people at the MIT Initiative and the digital economy are doing as well. So the first question is, is technology directable? So in some models of technological change, uh, scientists and innovators and entrepreneurs can say, hey, look, wages are really high right now. Let's make sure to automate those people. Or they'll say, 
hey, look, wages are really low right now. Let's invent a new job for those people to do. So to the extent that technology is directable, that should put a kind of um, evening out of wild oscillations in wages, right? You should automate more when wages are high, automate less, create new jobs for people when wages are low. In the paper by Daron Asamoglu, he says that technological change should be biased towards abundant factors. So the argument there is that if um, you get a big wave of immigration of people with a certain skill, there's an incentive for people to build tools that are complement to that skill. And if you, because there's more people who are gonna buy the machines that you make, and that will tend to raise the wages of that group. So you get a big burst of immigration in the short run because of supply and demand that lowers the wages of that group, but in the long run because of the directed technological change, the wages of the group can increase. A second question is, and so that's an open question. A second question is, is technological change accelerating or decelerating? I gave you some qualitative um, reasons to believe that maybe technological change is accelerating and there's some theoretical reasons as well. But if you look at the rates of return in R&D in a couple of different industries, you'll see that they've actually been declining. So we've seen Moore's Law starting to break down despite bigger and bigger investments by computer companies in R&D. And we've seen the rate of drug patenting go down dramatically despite increased R&D by drug companies. Finally, and this is a paper uh, based on, this is a research question that me and Eric Brynjolfsson are working on right now, is in the theoretical model that I just told you of how automation should work, when the new technology comes along, people are really excited about making the new technology. They go out, they buy it, and they bid up interest rates. But as we all know, it, real interest rates are super low right now. Belgium just issued a 100-year bond right at the target inflation rate. Um, and this isn't just a tr cyclical trend. So real interest rates in the world sort of peaked around 1980, 1985, and have been declining steadily ever since. So that the peak was during the Volcker recession, and has been declining steadily ever since. So that's a big riddle for these theories of automation. Why aren't interest rates up right now? And um, there are a couple of plausible explanations and less plausible explanations. Uh, one less, uh, some less plausible, ex and I can go into the less plausible explanations. The theory that Eric and I are working on is that there are some scarce factors in the economy that you can't invest in, that you can't just buy more of and create outputs in. So there are three inputs in the economy, which might be uh, ordinary workers, capital, and certain very, very high skilled workers. And if those people are complemented to the other two inputs, even as you get technological progress in normal capital and normal labor, all of the money is going to go to these very, very specialized workers or people who own very, very specialized inputs. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges. So I like to think about challenges from automation in two different groups. The first group is a challenge of workers versus capitalists, right? So we've seen labor share go down. A second challenge is people who are just getting the safe rate of return, which is very low, versus people who have access to really productive investments who are, can make very high rates of return. And then finally, this divide between the superstar workers who are making lots of money and everybody else. So that's a distributional challenge that can be solved with you know, redistributive policies and you can talk about what you prefer in terms of a UBI versus traditional welfare versus something like a negative income tax. In the United States, we have the earned income tax credit. But then there's another set of challenges that aren't purely distributional. One challenge might be insufficient job training and structural unemployment. So in a fascinating paper by Pasquale Restrepo, he points out that if too many people have the bad old skills instead of the new good skills, that creates a disincentive for firms to create job openings with the new good skills, which thereby in turn disincentivizes people from acquiring those new good skills. So it's possible that there's a negative externality from people having the wrong kind of skills and therefore a role for government in trying to retrain people. Second, this is more of a theoretical issue, uh, but this is based on some work with Jeffrey Sachs and Larry Kotlikoff, as well as Guillermo Regarda, is uh, that if the labor share goes down and if most saving investment comes from workers saving for retirement, 
then there's a concern that there's going to be inadequate saving and investment. Um, and therefore, there's not going in the future, the, even though the robots are very productive, there aren't a lot to go to round. And so both wages are low and total income is low. That, I will, I will point out, is one of the scenarios uh, pointed out by Isaac Asimov in his book, uh, Caves of Steel. Ask Asimov, one of the great thinkers about robotics. Um, in the more distant future, you might worry about having too many robots and people becoming alienated from society. That's um, talked about in Asimov's book, The Naked Sun. And then finally, you might think about robots that, uh, robots or new technologies that are so powerful and also have goals that are misaligned with humanity's goals. And so Nick Bostrom at the Center for Existential Risk at Oxford has written a book, uh, Super Intelligence, about how do you make sure that very clever AIs don't get out of control. And then uh, other issues I'm happy to talk about uh, are privacy, obviously, is an issue with new technologies, uh, intellectual property taxation, algorithmic bias. There are plenty of these issues. Okay. How do we address these challenges? For workers, in the short term, there's a lot of incentive to try to acquire the skills, these machine learning skills. So in the last couple of years, let me just set aside for a second, uh, these graphs are from the AIindex.com, uh, the AI Index, which is a joint Stanford-MIT project looking to track the development of artificial intelligences. That's uh, an ongoing project. It might be a good source of information for some of you. Um, so five times growth in people looking for uh, AI skills. And then in the long term, think about interpersonal skills, right? So what are things that essentially robots can't do? So these might be empathetic tasks like counseling um, or tasks that are creative to the extent that robots can't do creative things. Um, and then there's a question of what are the sort of tasks in the future that we will want essentially humans to do versus robots to do, right? So right now we can't, we would dismiss the possibility of having a robotic counselor, but maybe we'll change our minds about that in the future. And then what this comic is getting at is right now we think it would be absurd for humans to you know, operate the bits in a computer, but maybe people will get value out of humans doing that in the future. There's a joke that I ran into at a uh, conference on robotics recently, uh, which was, you know, in Brooklyn, they're such hipsters that once we get automated cars, they'll still have, you know, artisanal bus drivers who will come and be grouchy at you and drive badly, right? So you can, you know, hipsters, okay. Um, firms, okay. So like I say, the biggest challenge for firms with these new technologies is how can we reorganize tasks to fit machine capabilities? How can we make sure that the robots are doing what the robots are good at be if the robots are cheap? And how can we make sure that the humans are only doing tasks that we can't easily automate? So there's gonna be having to think about what, how to reorganize jobs. Um, using robotic decision making when appropriate. There are several contexts in which AI has been used in either job hiring or there was recently um, Google DeepMind released a study which was that at a data center, by turning on an artificial intelligence, they were able to reduce uh, electricity costs by 40% by more optimally cooling the system. And then, as we all know, if you can become a platform as a company, that's an immensely profitable position to be in. But if you're in a business, if you're in an industry that's become disrupted by a platform, <coughs> um, you're going to be faced with a bunch of challenges. For investors, in the short term, think about platforms and scarce factors. If you have an opportunity to buy up a company that has a lot of these really high skilled workers who have access to the ability to implement these techniques, go for it. Even if they're working on something stupid right now, you can reorient them to working on something good. Um, and platforms, if you have an opportunity to invest in something that might become a platform early on, that might be a very profitable opportunity. Second is there may be a opportunity to make money from dealing with industries that have governments and overcapacity issues. So uh, Jensen talks about uh, the invention of radial tires. When radial tires first came along, it was a technology that you could subtly tweak the factories that made tires, and their productivity, the, the, the amount that the tires lasted, went up by five times. 
Now, it turns out that the world economy has a relatively inelastic demand for tires, so you had an overcapacity of tire production. And for a long time, different tire companies were all losing money because all of them were saying, no, you shut down, I want to be the only tire factory remaining, and vice versa. And in a situation like that, there may be an opportunity for a hostile takeover to shut, those shut down businesses in industries with overcapacity down. And then finally, um, although interest rates have not increased recently, as we're able to overcome bottlenecks, if it's the case that we're able to overcome these issues of a limited amount of very high-skilled people or very well-connected people, then the productivity of robots, the productivity of ordinary workers should start to increase. And by Le Chatelier's principle, which is that inputs are always more substitutable in the long run than the short run, that's something that I think we can reasonably expect to in happen eventually, although I can't tell you how long. In terms of governments, to deal with the distributional issue, people have talked about uh, a universal basic income. That has uh, positives and negatives in its approach, in its uh, impact versus something like traditional welfare or a negative, uh, negative, negative income tax, like in America, the e in earned income tax credit. Um, subsidizing stepping stone jobs in education, as I said, there may be a negative externality from having too many workers of the bad old skills, and therefore an opportunity for a government to improve things by investing in these uh, jobs in education. Um, Bill Gates famously talked recently about taxing the robots, and so there's a question of whether that would be a good approach to redistributing gains from winners to losers or selectively subsidizing R&D if you could identify technologies that tend to benefit workers rather than uh, capitalists. Is there a way you could do that? Although, for that bullet point, the big challenge is can you even, can the government successfully identify these? Could the government say, you know, this form of investment good, that form of investment bad, and have it be accurate and have bite? Perhaps not. Minimum wages and labor protections. To the extent that what you think is happening in labor, con in industry concentration, excuse me, in industry concentration is greater monopoly power on behalf of firms, then perhaps this is a good approach to getting some of those gains back for workers. But if what you think is happening there uh, is due to some other phenomenon, or if you're worried about di uh, directed technological change, minimum wages and labor protections might be a very bad idea. The argument there is, uh, suppose so there are lots of studies evaluating do minimum wages decrease employment, right? And what they tend to find is either no effect on employment or a small negative effect on employment. But these studies tend to be very short-run studies, right? And what you might be worried about is in the medium term, if companies say, sure, in the short run, I have to hire those more uh, burger flippers at my McDonald's, I'll pay them a little bit more, but now in the medium term, I'm gonna try to work harder to invent a burger flipping robot. The medium term impact for minimum wages might be much more negative for workers than for the short term impact. So some of those studies might not be accurate. Uh, finally, uh, or second to finally, and to finally, uh, Germany, in their uh, Work 4.0 dialogue, has talked about an idea called personal employment accounts. And so what that would be is a transfer that the government gives you, uh, that you enter the labor force with, that could be used for some selective things related to employment. So you could you get a, a transfer of money that's invested in the stock market that you can only spend on relocating for a job or for um, getting job training or things of that nature. So that'd be interesting, kind of a conditional transfer to try to make yourself more employable. And then finally, very recently, Glenn Weil has proposed this idea of data as labor, which is the idea that Google and Facebook are making so much money off of all of us as customers, shouldn't they be paying us a little bit back for that? Um, I think there are some flaws with that idea. The most obvious one is it's probably the case that the data of a rich person is worth more than the data of a poor person. So it's unclear that this is going to fix inequality at all. And secondly, we all know data wants to be free. We want to price data that has a zero marginal cost of use at a very low price. 
so it's, uh, this may have negative, welfare, uh, negative efficiency implications if we're pricing something above its marginal cost. And so I'm very eager to hear your questions. I think I'm gonna wrap it up there. I've got a lot of backup slides if you wanna see some extra figures, uh, but I'm really eager to hear from all of you. Okay. Bueno, llega la hora de hacer preguntas, después de darle las gracias a Seth por su exposición. Preguntas. Hay que esperar el micrófono. Uh, I'm, question one. Uh, I'm Amado Hernández, Global IT Director in Madrid, Mesodice. Uh, I think you mentioned the Moore's Law and I just wanted to, and I see the, the, the topic of the, of the conversation is the impact of technology on governments and people. And I don't know if I, if you spoke or and I, miss, you know, I misunderstood some one part I think is quite important. Is that um, the ability for the governments and for at the end for the people to absorb the speed of the new technological changes. So for me, it's, uh, as far as I see, um, for instance, if you see the, the land phone, it took 75 years to reach 100 million users. While Pokemon Go, it took one month. Uh, so that's uh, the reason behind is because the technology even is faster and faster. There are revolutionary technologies coming faster and faster. And my doubt, my question is, if we as people as and the governments are ready to absorb this speed of new revolution. So again, uh, the, the land phone was 75 years, so it was easy to absorb this revolution. But for Pokemon Go, it was one month. So, and as Moore, Moore's law says, every two years, we are duplicating the capacity of, our, of computer power. So this will be my question. How do you see that? Is, uh, obviously, technology is there, and will always be, uh, will always be, the, uh, be there. But is our capacity to absorb new technology growing or is a standard during our lifetime and then the technology is overtaking us more and more faster every time. Thank you. Um, so one thing I'll point out is that we, we do seem to be, if by just strict adoption, right, it does seem to be that in your anecdote, people are adopting Pokemon Go, right? So in terms of people going out and getting these technologies, they do seem to be grabbing them, at least some of them that are easily democratized that people have access to. In terms of technology like machine learning, which I just pointed out, um, it may be that in the short term, not every company can implement these techniques because there's just a shortage of people who are familiar with the cutting edge techniques or for how to think about a business and implement the new techniques. That being said, like I also pointed out, um, there are new ways of getting this, these new technologies um, out to lots of different firms. One way of doing that is Kaggle, uh, where you can just put out a problem and try to crowdsource a solution. Um, but I, I take it you're more interested in the, in the psychological question or the sociological question of what would happen. Um, it's certainly the case that some technologies are spreading very rapidly. Um, in terms of platforms, one of the cool things about them is that they don't have to make big investments in physical um, machines in order to grow, right? Uber doesn't have to go out there and buy a million cars, they just need to get on a million phones. Um, so to answer your question, it seems to be certainly the case that new technologies are diffusing very fast, at least in the consumer space. On the firm side, there is some challenge in adopting these new technologies in reorganizing your business to adapt and to making sure you have the right sort of customers. And then more sociologically and psychologically, um, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist. Um, people do seem more stressed out than before. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for sharing with us your knowledge. I am Agustin Argilic, I am telecom engineer 
and I remember the digital uh, economy committee of uh, Cyprus economy. No? Uh, I want to, uh, I'm a consultant and we are make comments and questions at the same time, so oh. sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I see in the, I, I am talking about the world and the planet in general, not uh, about the developed societies. No? Mm. I see that in the, in the planet, in the world, we have really great challenges. And my vision is that with the technology, we are able to solve really a great number of problems. You were talking about high skilled people. You were talking about recognition and the medicines and the doctors. But we need to know that there are a lot of people in the world that don't have access to healthcare systems. And thanks to this new technology, we are be able to help a lot of people. There are also other, other another aspect that I, I would like that you comment. It's about demography. In the societies, there is very important change in demography. So uh, in my opinion, yes, there will be very, very important change in the labor workforce, but it will be very difficult to have high skill people. So uh, I am more optimistic than you. <laughs> OK. Um. It's certainly the case that these new technologies uh, enable a lot of things in the third world uh, that were not possible before, right? And it's, I definitely agree that it's very exciting to think about getting world-class healthcare to people in um, places that are traditionally not connected to those really productive resources. Um, in terms of, so I, I definitely agree that that is a, a positive. A potential negative for the developing world is, of course, the idea that um, it's a lot of low-skilled and medium-skilled jobs that have been replaced in factory work jobs. And the way that a lot of third, uh, excuse me, developing world nations have tended to uh, grow and have economic growth is through, um, you know, getting these low-skilled uh, manufacturing done in their companies, and they've been used, able to use that as a springboard into further development. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps an perhaps a avenue that's going to be shut down now. If uh, I recent, somebody was telling me that they just built, uh, for the first time in who knows how many years, a sneaker factory in Germany, right? That's something that would have been inconceivable 10 or 20 years ago, because that used to be low-skilled work that would be done in Vietnam or a similar country. And so uh, there are certainly positives and negatives for the developing world. Very short question. Will China outrace the United States? <laughs> uh, so so that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, let me answer it with respect to artificial intelligence in particular, right? So. Let me zoom in a little bit. Let me first point out that in terms of artificial intelligence and the success of digital platforms, both uh, the United States and China seem to be doing a lot better than Europe. So a lot of the big platform companies are, you know, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, based in the United States, uh, as well as in uh, China, Alibaba, WeChat, companies like that. Whereas in Europe, as far as I know, the only big platform company is SAP. It's a notable exception. Um, in terms of artificial intelligence, a uh, lot of big companies doing that in the United States and China. In Europe, DeepMind was obviously a, an English-based team, but was just bought up by Google. Um, recently, the way it was described to me at the MIT CSAIL conference, so the Computer Science AI uh, conference that they do every year, um, a lecturer for China said that the United States tends to have better artificial intelligence and big data tools for business optimization, and that has to do with better data. So the Chinese businesses, perhaps for reasons of concealing their books from the government, are a lot more opaque in their record keeping, and so the United States has much better uh, business optimization data. 
that China is much better in artificial uh, intelligence and big data as applies to consumer problems, because they have fewer, even fewer privacy concerns than the United States, and they have a lot of pretty intrusive uh, surveillance, or that makes it sound draconian, uh, some uh, pretty extensive data on consumers, so that uh, China seems to be ahead of us along that dimension, and that China seems to be uh, a little bit farther ahead of the United States along the lines of Internet of Things platforms as well. So uh, there are some big bike sharing platforms in China and uh, related uh, platforms. So will, uh, will the US uh, be outrun by China? Well, you know, a lot of good universities in the US, a lot of smart people in China too. We're just gonna have to wait and see how it plays out. I would describe the US and China sort of as neck and neck in different domains in AI right now. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. So I was wondering what is your thinking about the impact of AI or technologies like AI on fiscal policies around the world and how can basically fiscal policy become a tool for us to, to like the way the uh, negative impact that we are talking about that this kind of technology will have. And the second thing which um, I would like to ask you is how can we solve the gap in between the AI engineering and the demand that we have actually, because we have like a huge gap in between these two. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. All right, so two excellent questions. I think I'll answer the second one first. Um, I do think like I, uh, there are, I there is increasing democratization, decreasing access to these cutting edge tools. Like I say, I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, like I barely know Python. I knew just enough Python to fake it, and I was able to get this state of the art image classifier up and running. Um, so, and then with things like Kaggle, every company doesn't have to be good at artificial intelligence itself. So if you're a company that wants to use artificial intelligence in order to figure out, you know, which of my machines are going to fail and when, when are my flights going to be on time and when are they going to be late, which of my clients are going to pay on time and which won't, these like prediction tasks that are important to your business but not central to your business. These can be crowdsourced through competition, online competitions like Kaggle. And you know, if you consistently get someone in Kaggle who's winning your online competitions, you can turn around and hire the guy, right? Um, and so I think that, and then of course, uh, automation of some of these uh, machine learning techniques with things like AutoML. So I do think that we are going to see, I, I'm not worried about those specific skills being in super short supply in the medium term. I think we will be uh, more democratized. In terms of, although, of course, there will always be a, um, a small subset of people who are truly at the cutting edge and moving the techniques forward. There'll be a large group of people implementing those newest techniques, you know, at a one, two year delay, but maybe that isn't so such a bad thing. Um, to answer your first question, um, I think it is, I think it is certainly very important to try to use fiscal policy to correct these inequalities that seem to be created by technologies. And I talked about the three different inequalities between capital and labor, high and low skilled workers, and between really productive firms and less productive firms. Um, and I think that fiscal policy is the right way to solve that problem rather than regulation, right? So I told about, I talked about some potential downsides of things like minimum wages or like banning some of these services. Um, in terms of what fiscal policy is the right one to choose, I think it's gonna depend a lot on the specific circumstances and goal of, of the country. So the advantage of traditional welfare is you can really target it towards the most needed pe needy people in what they need, right? The disadvantage of traditional welfare is sometimes you get people stuck in poverty traps where it's better for them to stay on welfare than to go out and get a job where they'll have effectively less income after all their government services are lost. In terms of universal basic income, you have the benefit of it in some ways being a very neoliberal market-based solution Right? Uh, it was originally supported by people like Milton Friedman, who was a conservative economist, who viewed it as a great replacement for traditional welfare because now you're just giving people cash transfers 
and they can spend it on whatever they want to, rather than the government telling them what they should spend the money on, or as is the case in a lot of parts of the United States, receiving a food stamp, turning around uh, to tur uh, selling the food stamp for pennies on the dollar, and then using that to buy what they actually want, right? Um, Fi a final approach to dealing with inequality is people have talked about negative income taxes. Um, that has the advantage of kind of explicitly being an incentive to go out and get work, uh, but the disadvantage of not being targeted at the very, very poorest people, right? So it seems like one thing you would want a welfare program to do is help people at the very bottom, and if you can go out and get a job, you're not elderly or an infirm. And uh, John Rawls would have us make sure that the transfers get to the very, very bottom people. So certainly a role for fiscal policy, pros and cons to different ones of these approaches. wondering when you talk about all these developments and you know all these changes in people skills or environment any learnings from for instance the introduction of computing desktop computing desktop uh, computer soft computing in the past years and anything that is applicable to current situation so that's a good question i'll show you one of my backup slides i can get to it which is, uh, to answer your question, um, so Ottawa and Dorn in their study looked at regions that were previously focused on routine tasks. So one of the big groups of routine tasks is like middle skilled office work, typesetting documents, moving papers around to the right person. What he found was that regions that specialized in these tasks disproportionately imported desktop computers. So actually their measure of information and communication technologies is literally computers per worker, right? And as these regions imported more computers per worker, they saw increased employment and wage polarization, and they received inflows of skilled labor from other places. So in the past, what the trend has been is that PCs were adopted by regions that specialized in routine tasks, they were used to automate people in those routine tasks, and then high-skilled people from other regions moved in to operate those PCs. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I have a question, and I am also a member of the digital group here in Cerro La Economía. My name is uh, Rodolfo Fernández Cuellar. And I wonder what would happen if we accept that the uh, productivity will increase, will increase in terms of uh, the artificial intelligence being developed. Um, and also the governments will apply uh, tax, new taxes, new uh, contributions for social security and more wages for everybody. At the same time, this would be for uh, keeping safe and employed people, probably. Okay, uh, in these terms, uh, we can accept, or do you consider that uh, the entertainment industry and sectors will be real, the future will increase uh, considerably? Okay, so I think that's like two questions, so I'll try to answer the first <coughs> one first. So the first question is, do we think, pr so do we think productivity is going to start increasing more rapidly? So one of the big riddles here is that despite all these cool innovative technologies that seem to be replacing people in their jobs, measured productivity growth has actually been pretty slow, right? This is documented in such books as Gordon's Rise and Fall of American Growth. Um, one theor hypothesis for that is that there is some sort of scarce complement to uh, these new technologies which <coughs> are holding growth back. Other theories are that there's unmeasured growth uh, from all of the value in free goods out there. Um, although some people say that that's too small to make a difference, um, as well as people who hypothesize that it's going to take some time for companies to make all of the intangible investments necessary to get output growth. So we're seeing 
unmeasured output that's being reinvested in the form of intangible capital. So there's a question of, are we actually seeing the productivity growth or not, are we not? But that being said, we do think new technologies should raise productivity in the long run. So certainly it's the case that one of the benefits of productivity growth is you get more output overall. And you know the way this is supposed to work is you take those output gains and hopefully they get automatically distributed by the market in a kind of fair and equal way. But if they're not, there's a role for government in stepping in and redistribu redistributing between the winners and losers to make it a Pareto gain for everybody. So I think that that's on point and I think that that is a direction that people should move into. Now you ask me next whether do I think uh, the entertainment, what was the other industry? Yeah. Do I think the entertainment industry will see become a bigger part of the economy? I haven't gotten that question before. That's a good new one. Um, my my guess is yes. Um, you know, if you if you had me bet on it, I guess it would grow as a percentage of the economy in the sense that we would expect that this if the sectors of the economy are all kind of gross complements, right? You want an even mix of everything, and robots are getting increasingly good at making more, you know, um, simple commodities, and they're getting increasingly good at providing us uh, with all sorts of things that are easily automated, then it makes sense that as a share of our total income, we would spend more income on the entertainment industries, which might be produced by people who can't uh, be replaced by computers. So I think, I think that's a fair bet. optimistic group of people. However, I have to say that after your presentation, you, you can expect that uh, artificial intelligence and probably more uh, machine learning, they will change uh, the labor market itself and uh, also some job position. Having said that, but uh, do you think that this is also an opportunity to change the role of the employee. Do you think that the concept of dependence in order to the employment relationship is going to change? We will create a kind of employee which is more similar to a prosumer and uh, we will move to a, a wider s uh, concept of um, dependence as in fact they have already said so the tribunals when analyzing uh, employment relationship in uh, Uber, Cabify, Deliveroo, and platforms coming. It's an excellent question. Um, I do think that these new technologies will change the nature of both being a consumer and the sorts of jobs people do. Um, to think about that anecdote that I told, the, the story that I told before about how if you're Amazon and you want to deliver a package, there's this issue of maybe you need to have somebody sit in the driverless car the whole time to make sure the package actually gets to the door. But one other proposed solution to that problem is you just have the consumer come out and pick up the package from the truck, right? So sometimes the solution to the problem isn't changing the nature of the job, it's changing the nature of what the consumer does, right? So there's certainly, and maybe that's an example of a uh, pro prosumer, right? Um, in terms of should, in terms of the nature of the relationship between the worker and the firm, I think it's certainly the case that even though computers are better at doing things that we might not generally think of as routine, they're certainly very context dependent, right? And if you throw a real wild card at any of these machine learning techniques, like a balloon that looks like a tomato, it might get pretty confused, right? And so as these sort of bespoke situations ad arise, you'll want a human on the scene to deal with the bespoke situation that might occur only once in a while, right? And so you might not want to hire an employee to sit there all the time. You just want to hire somebody for a day, for a week to resolve that issue. So I think that this idea of a gig economy 
of you know, a lot more of the workforce being temporary contractors who can deal with spot issues, I definitely see that as being more common, especially insofar as it is enabled by these platforms themselves, right? So not only will there be a greater need for these people, there's going to be a greater capacity for a, for a business to handle these people. And that's what we've seen with Uber and Airbnb, is that they dramatically reduced transaction costs. So a lot of these deals that otherwise wouldn't have been possible to do are now possible. Um, in terms of, I, I know people have talked about sort of regulating the relationship between Uber drivers and Uber, and to give them a role that's more like traditional employment, and I think that that may be a mistake uh, for the same reasons that a minimum wage might be a mistake. To the extent that you make, to the extent that you make it more unattractive to firms to hire workers, that may or may not have a short-term effect on employment, but it will, but it will possibly additionally have a medium-term effect on employment as those firms try to think about, hey, how can I automate this job? Uh, and again, that's still an open question to the extent that firms can direct their automation in that way. Um, so thanks for your conference. Um, my name is Pilar Conesa. I am also a member of the um, Digital Economy Group. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, your conference, because it's clear that there is a, a trend uh, how the artificial intelligence will will impact the, the industry, the, the labor mar market. And, and the question is how drastically the change will came and how uh, we have to prepare for, for it. You have been, uh, um, you talk about the, the, the challenge for the, for the companies to reorganize the um, the um, uh, the jobs and I think this is clear and thinking on this and 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 also taking into account that today there is not enough engineers not only high level engineers for um, artificial intelligence uh, big data or others there are no there are no so engineers for developers that the companies need. Uh, have you uh, analyzed uh, what will be the job profiles that will be needed in the future, and also how um, the society and the and the and the, educa and the education sector have to be prepared to start training another way or training with another profiles? Uh, it's an excellent question, and in this is another one of those questions that uh, is a little bit of guesswork. Um, so I talked a little bit about the sort of things that we think that automation will be good at, right? Which is um, mapping from standardized inputs to standardized outputs according to a clear success criteria. Um, there's a lot of jobs that can kind of be thought of that way. And so then the question is, is how, what sort of skills aren't that, right? It's being flexible, it's dealing with out of context situations, it's reasoning in new situations that maybe you haven't seen before. It's doing things that computers um, just are fundamentally incapable of. And what's important there is that's in part a style, that's a, in part like a style sociological question, right? Where are you comfortable interacting with a computer? So um, one example of this is, has anybody ever used one of those automated checkout lanes at a grocery store? They're like terrible, right? I hate interacting with them, right? Um, but maybe in the future, we'll just like get used to it and that'll just be another job that the consumer has to do, right? Um, so in part, this is, so for that reason, it's sort of a sociological kind of uncertain question what the style will be. And relatedly in this job reorganization, it is also unclear to what extent the jobs will be able to be reorganized. So um, I can't really give you a specific answer about what sort of skills and jobs people will be doing 10, 20 years from now, but I can tell you that um, it's likely to be empathetic, interpersonal jobs, coaching, counseling, therapy, um, 
you know, religious jobs, like being a priest. Nobody wants a robot priest. Um, those are the sorts of jobs I would bet on sticking around in the, in the long term. Seth, can you take one last question? Ab uh, I'm, I, I have to go right now. <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Última pregunta. Thank you, Seth, for your thoughtful uh, lecture today. Uh, let me try to, to mm, reduce my question to one sentence regarding the growth and the dominance of platforms that you mentioned. Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, or Airbnb. If any market will have a bigger leader, uh, do you believe that this situation will move economies to a higher technological gap between the leader and the other competitors in any industry? I think certainly yes. I think we've been seeing that. I think that if you are one of the so it's an interesting question. So actually, maybe it's not as simple as that. Um, so if you think about a company like Facebook, it certainly seems to be the case that Facebook, there was a period of time where Facebook and MySpace both existed, right? And Facebook and MySpace had sort of infinite potential. MySpace could be making all of the money that Facebook was making today. But Facebook came along, and they were a little bit better. And now, instead of everybody being on MySpace, everybody's on Facebook. So there certainly seems to be a winner-take-all aspect to these digital markets, right? That being said, there is also um, a resistance. So if you're asking me, is the leader, there's certainly going to be a divergence between the amount of money that the leader makes and the followers make in terms of that getting more skewed. But I think you asked, is the technological gap between the leaders and the followers going to get bigger and smaller? And that's sort of an interesting question moving forward, right? So you might think that a company like Facebook um, is going to eventually become one of these slow, you know, unagile behemoths, and other more nimble competitors will come up with a better digital platform idea, right? Another better, you know, social network 2.0, right? Or I guess, uh, what are we on, 5.0 now? A better social network. And then the question is, Facebook's got this huge entrenched advantage in that everybody signed up to Facebook. How easy is it for everybody to switch to the new company, right? So there may very well be a pretty long interval in which Facebook isn't the most technologically sophisticated, but it still has all of the users and all of the profits. So in these digital markets where there does seem to be a natural monopoly, uh, from these network effects, um, I there's certainly an advantage to being on the top. You know, you can spend the most money and the most resources on keeping on the top. But if for some reason you screwed up and you weren't making those investments and you started to slip and other companies became more technologically agile, you might not be replaced immediately. It might take a long time for people to make the switch over to the new company. So. Um, it's, I, I, don't, I think it's underdetermined. I think both possibilities are possible. Okay, Seth. Thank you very much. Thank you.